Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 25th meeting of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee. Can we please ensure that all electronic devices are on silent mode? Agenda item one is Age of Criminal Responsibility Scotland Bill, and our first item of business today is our final stage one evidence session on the Age of Criminal Responsibility Scotland Bill. I'd like to welcome Marie Todd, Minister for Children and Young People, Paul Beaton, Bill Team Leader, Tom McNamara, Head of Youth Justice and Children's Hearings, and Liz Blair, Senior Principal Legal Officer with the Scottish Government. Good morning, everyone. Um, if I can invite the Minister to make an opening statement, please. Good morning, convener, and thank you for inviting me to give evidence on the general principles of this bill today. Throughout my life, I have always believed that how we treat and view children says much about who we are as a nation and as a society. Children deserve to be valued, to be loved, to be cared for and nurtured, and we owe it to them and their families to make sure that they hear that message loud and clear. Above all, we must make sure that our most vulnerable and disadvantaged children and young people hear that message and see it in action. And that's why the evidence that we've heard from James Doherty of the Violence Reduction Unit and Lindsay Hambage of Who Cares Scotland matters so much. Their honest and moving accounts of their experiences serve as very stark reminders to us of what is at stake for young people who come into contact with care and justice agencies and why we must work together to change that experience for the better. So as Minister for Children and Young People, I feel hugely privileged to be leading and guiding this bill through Parliament to raise the age of criminal responsibility. That fundamental premise at the heart of the bill shouldn't be overlooked, and I would like to ask the committee to consider the change as just one part of the government's work and journey to bring a rights-focused approach into all areas of government policy relating to children, especially when it comes to the children most affected by early trauma and adversity. I know there are some on this committee and in this parliament and indeed in external organisations who think that this change is much needed and long overdue. And I understand that some don't feel that we're going far enough and that the age should be raised further. I'm very keen to hear your views on that. But I want to be very clear that, in my view, the age at which we re propose raising criminal responsibility is the right one, supported by the vast majority of respondents to our consultation and also in your written evidence. It's the age at which there's shared professional and public confidence in our proposals. We haven't arrived at the measures in this bill on our own. We've taken a very collaborative approach to this work. Many of the individuals and organisations you've heard from were members of the 2016 advisory group. Many continue to contribute to the working groups which have begun the detailed planning for the implementation for the bill, if it's passed. Throughout the development of the bill, we're making significant continuing efforts to seek the views of those who will be most affected, especially children and young people. And informed by thorough and ongoing engagement and consultation, this bill represents what I believe is a balanced and thoughtful yet ambitious reform package for Scotland at this time. The reforms in this bill need to be considered within the wider, unique context of our approach of taking a child-centred approach to addressing their needs. Our distinct children's hearing system plays a critical role in addressing and responding to children's um, behaviour. It provides a flexible, child-centred and welfare-based framework for exploring and addressing the harmful behaviours which some children and young people engage in, where decisions are taken to safeguard and to promote the child's welfare. That system, focusing on the needs of children, whether perpetrators, victims, with broader needs, and of course, many of the children are all of those, is almost unique. So the children's hearing system is almost unique, and I think that's very important for us to bear in mind when comparing what we are doing here in Scotland with what is happening in other countries. This bill is a very strong statement that no matter what a child has done under 12, it is our ethical duty as a society to treat them as children first and to acknowledge that rarely does a child with no adverse childhood experiences or challenging circumstances engage in harmful behaviour. But we're also clear that safeguards are required. There will on occasion be a very small number of cases that constitute really serious harmful behaviour. 
and the Bill provides that in those very rare situations where it's necessary to use police powers, safeguarding and promoting the well-being of the child has to remain a primary focus for all of those involved while setting out the steps which should be followed. We also recognise and appreciate the need to ensure that those exposed to harmful behaviour by young children continue to be properly supported. The experiences and perspectives of all victims require serious consideration and an effective response which helps them to address trauma which they may have endured. We will ensure that appropriate information and support is available to all of those children and adults who need it. And in this regard, we have heard a range of views as to what is appropriate to put into legislation and whether there might be omissions currently. I undertake to keep listening, to consider carefully all of the evidence and, where appropriate, bring forward amendments in that regard. I want to conclude on these fundamental points. Every child deserves equal treatment under the law, and all children deserve to be treated in law as we ourselves would want to be treated. It is our duty as a government and as a parliament to ensure that we put in place the right laws and to enable the right practice that enables our children to flourish and to get it right for every child. And I believe that the, age of, the principles of the Age of Criminal Responsibility Bill achieve this, and I hope you agree. I welcome the very thoughtful approach that you have been taking to date, and I thank everyone who has provided written or oral evidence. Myself and my officials are very happy to answer questions in more detail now and as the bill progresses. Thank you, Minister. We're going to move um, straight to questions from the committee. and We've got a lot to, to get through this morning, so I'll just straight away bring in my uh, colleague, Alec o Hamilton. Thank you very much, convener. Good morning, Minister, and good morning to your colleagues. I should remind the committee of my uh, register of interest. I'm a past convener of the Scottish Alliance for Children's Rights. Before we get into the detail of the bill, Minister, I'm just keen to uh, understand the landscape in which the bill finds itself. And obviously, the First Minister announced in the programme for government speech the intention of your government to incorporate the principles of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. A number of those rights are contained within this bill. Um, incorporation is a, a very sort of specific ask and language matters here and the test the international test of incorporation is that if those rights the, the rights afforded to children by the 42 articles are encroached upon children will have access to justice and rem judicial remedy should they be encroached upon that matters to this bill will that be the case when uh, you achieve your goal of incorporating the principles i believe so yes absolutely that's fine um, Mary Fee. Thank you, um, good morning, Minister. Good morning, um, panel. Um, I, I'd like to focus on um, the age that's in the bill, the age of, of, of 12. And I, I listened with interest to your um, opening contribution, Minister, because you, you spoke about um, the way, um, how, how we treat and view children says much about who we are. Um, we should love and nurture them. Um, we should um, make sure that vulnerable and disadvantaged children hear that message um, and that we should have a rights-focused approach. And you also said that um, we needed to be ambitious, and this bill was ambitious. So could you explain to me, if this bill is ambitious, the UNCRC recommend a minimum age of 12. Why do you think moving to the minimum is ambitious? So we absolutely recognise that there are people who passionately believe that the age of criminal responsibility should be higher than 12, and I have to say I do understand those arguments. I understand that the proposal to raise the age of criminal responsibility was first made at the very first Cabinet meeting after devolution. It is this government and this administration which raised the age of criminal um, prosecution, and it is this government and this administration which ra is proposing to raise the age of criminal responsibility. And I think the length of time it's taken probably illustrates the um, lack of consensus across the country for that move. But we're there now. We've worked very collaboratively with a number of groups across the country to achieve this. And we believe that changing the age to 12 is absolutely the right choice for Scotland at this time. It marks a significant transition from childhood to adolescence, and it's an age which already has significance in Scots law. So 
that's the age at which um, children can make a will, will or um, veto their adoption. They are considered to have sufficient understanding to express views on matters like um, future arrangements for their care, to form a view to express at a children's hearing, to receive hearings reports. And when we're talking about the children's hearing system, I think you have to... Um, the, the importance of that unique system can't be overstated. Um, it provides a flexible and welfare-based framework for dealing with the children that engage in harmful behaviour. Young people, the age of criminal responsibility is therefore, it's part of a much wider framework which takes account of the age and stage that children are at. And when we're changing the age, we have to be confident that our professionals share an understanding of what works and what to do when things go wrong, and that our systems can respond appropriately. Um, children and families have to know that serious harmful behaviour will be dealt with seriously when necessary. Um, but for the child, that shouldn't be a criminalising experience. Um, young people have to be able to leave behind the behaviour that was associated with their youth, with the lack of maturity. And to that end, it's really important to see this bill acting along with um, and in conjunction, conjunction with the Review of Management um, of Offenders Bill and the um, PVG review. So there's, you know, there's a much bigger picture going on. The final thing I would ask you to note is that age 12 is the age which commands confidence and extremely strong support. So when we asked and consulted in, in 2016, 88% of respondents um, supported raising it to the age of 12. When you've asked for oral and written evidence, 63% of um, respondents supported raising it to the age of 12. And it's absolutely vital in this situation to build and sustain public and professional confidence so very, very careful consideration has gone into choosing the age of 12. If we move to the age of 12, we'll be one of only four countries in, in Europe that have an age of 12. One of only four countries. And again, I make the point, we will sit on the floor of what the UNCRC recommends. Um, and I come back to my original question about the ambition of moving it to 12. To be ambitious, mm -hmm. you would move it more than 12. Did you consider raising it higher than 12? When we look at, I mean, we have considered it, absolutely. Moving it to? <laughs> we con we've considered all ages and we've settled on 12. And I have to you know, reiterate again, that is the age for which there is very strong support. When you look at other countries, it's very clear. I mean, you can't make comparisons directly between countries because the, the, the headline age doesn't capture the nuance. The age means different things in different countries. Um, in Scotland, the vast majority of children will continue to be dealt with by the children's hearing system and not by the criminal justice system um, beyond the age of 12. And I think that's absolutely vital to understand. When I look at the headline, I mean, I, I would also say, you know, cultural context is very important. So we will have the highest age of criminal responsibility within the UK. Um, Luxembourg, for example, has a headline age of 18, but there are real idiosyncrasies in that. And I would urge you, if you're interested, to look at the idiosyncrasies in, in, in the different countries. So children in, uh, who are under 16 in Luxembourg, although they nominally have a criminal age of responsibility of 18, have to be dealt with in a youth court. And the youth court can impose penal measures, including deprivation of liberty, solitary confinement for up to 10 days, and there's no age limit on that. So I don't think it's a useful thing to look just at the headline age. And my, my final question can be and then I will um, allow others to, to come in. Do you have any proposals to review and increase the age? So certainly um, the UNCRC advises us to um, keep further reform in this area on the agenda, and we definitely will. Future moves have to follow the evidence. Um, so we would need to be sure that the move to age 12 had worked well. The public would have to have confidence in what we're doing. I'm open-minded about it. 
Um, I'd be very, very interested in hearing this committee's views on that issue and in hearing um, consider, you know, what, what you might consider would be a reasonable length of time to, to let this system bed in and test it and what you think we may need to monitor in the interim period so that we can have confidence in moving on beyond 12. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, convener, and thank you, uh, Minister. Um, the, it's taken 70 years, really, for, for this issue to be, be looked at again. I do not accept, like a number of the witnesses that we've seen, that uh, once this decision is made, uh, that could be it for another 70 years? Um, no, I don't. I mean, I think um, you just have to look at the record of this government and see the level of progressiveness across the board in, on, on a whole area. This is just one aspect of a much bigger picture. So, no, I don't. So, uh, why, if you basically think the bill's inadequate and not progressive enough for yourself, are you not bringing something forward that's more progressive now rather than uh, risking the chance that we could wait another 70 years for change? So I think you have to understand that, 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 that it's extremely rare an occasion which a child under 12 engages in seriously harmful behaviour. But it does happen, and the public and all of the people working in the justice system um, have to have confidence that we are able to respond appropriately to those extremely rare situations. And exactly the same point that we made about a child at 13? Well, <laughs> or 14? I've, or 15? 16? So this is the, this 12 is the age at which we have confidence that we are able to do this. And the numbers um, of offending um, of, of children who engage in harmful behaviour and would come into the contact of the system are much smaller below 12 than above 12. That's one of the reasons for having confidence in this. We can um, look at this very carefully. I do not believe this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. I think you've seen that um, we raised the age of criminal prosecution some time ago. We've taken our time to be absolutely confident that that has that the systems are delivering us what we would hope they would deliver us and we are now confident about making the taking the next step of raising the age of criminal responsibility I'm, I understand you might be uh, you know more, more confident uh, than, than maybe I am about how much time uh, you maybe have as a government to to make these changes but does it not worry you uh, that the children's commissioner is confused uh, about why you've chosen the age of 12 and says that the question should not be to just should not be about how to justify raising the age from 8 to 12 uh, but how we justify treating children under 18 in a criminal manner does that, that that not worry you so as i said i understand absolutely why um, there are people who passionately believe um, in different ages to either, to, to either. I said that in response to the very first question that Mary Fee gave me. I understand that. I think it's absolutely appropriate that the Children's Commissioner, I mean, he's carrying out his role as appropriately as Children's Commissioner to campaign um, for that. But, but we have, we have you, built... You think on this issue he's wrong? We have built consensus you think around he's that age. Right or wrong? I think we'll let the Minister answer the question that you've asked, please. So as I said... We have built um, this. This is not work that I have done on my own. This is work that built on a great deal of work um, from, you know, from 2015 onwards. And, and it is 12 is the age which commands majority support. 12 is the age at which we have confidence is correct. And I am absolutely sure that it is the right step to take at this time. Thank you. A couple of supplementaries on that, um, Alec Cole Hamilton. Thank you, Convener. Um, Minister, in your opening remarks, you uh, mentioned the very powerful testimony of Lindsay Hanvidge, and I think everybody on this committee was absolutely compelled by what she had to tell us. She was 13 at the time when that happened. She was taken into police custody as a result of her reaction to being taken into care. Nothing about this bill would change them, have changed that circumstance for Lindsay. Um, in that respect, um, you, you mentioned... Uh, the, the vast weight of consultation evidence that show that the public and stakeholders are, are 
support the age, the increase to the age of 12. Is that because the question you asked was, do you agree the age should be raised to 12? Or did they offer, we actually think it should go further as well? So in terms of the evidence that you have collected, about 63% said they, they agreed with the age of 12, but many of them saw that as a first step. With regard to the evidence that you got from Lindsay Hammond, I mean, I found listening to that evidence very harrowing and heartbreaking, and that is not the type of situation that we are talking about at the moment. I would say that should not have happened back then. That I mean, it was heartbreaking for me as Minister for Children and Young People to listen to somebody who was taken into the care of the state who spent their first night in care in a prison cell. I mean, absolutely yeah. appalling. But that is not what we're discussing here. There have been a whole range of um, issues which, which have um, that situation should not arise. It shouldn't have arisen then, and it should not arise now. What we're talking about here is very serious, harmful behaviour, um, not taking children into care. So um, I'll pick this up in my um, later line of questioning, um, but don't you think that this bill represents a, a perfect opportunity to create uh, parameters under which what happened to Lindsay can never happen to a 13-year-old again? I think there are other opportunities to create those parameters. I mean, perhaps one of my officials would like to talk about the bigger picture. Yes. Um, good morning. Um, on that specific point in relation to the question and, and, and to Lindsay's experience, my understanding that the focus of the practice guidance review in relation to joint investigative interviews is directly contemplating the 12-year-old the to the 18-year-old cohort at the moment, and alongside that, recognising that there are very little um, material distinctions between, for example, an 11-and-a-half-year-old and a 12-and-a-half-year-old who want to build in terms of experiences for children and young people is more of a continuum of experience that's appropriate to their, um, their age and, and therefore to their increasing maturity. So, um, as the Minister outlined in, in her own remarks, the Bill should be seen in the context of a wider approach, particularly to children under 12, but it also connects into a wider set of efforts that relate to um, young people 12 to 18, um, for example, in relation to the Protection of Vulnerable Groups review, we're looking to, um, to encourage a further dialogue in relation to how the state would respond to harmful behaviour um, and recognise a, a kind of sliding scale of, of maturity and experience in relation to them. OK. Um, Gail Ross had a supplementary. Um, yes, good morning, um, Minister um, and panel. I just wanted to try and um, tease out a little bit about, and, and by the way, I, I disagree just because it took us 70 years to get to this point, that it's going to take us another 70 years to get to another point. So I wanted to try and um, pick that up. What do, what do the panel think? If we're, if we're going to 12 just now and that's agreed and that, that, that goes into legislation, what are we looking at for a review period? What do you think would be a good time to, I mean, I'm, I'm not talking about post ledge scrutiny because that'll be done anyway. But to um, to to put um, some sort of clause in, if it's appropriate, to to go back and look at it and and see um, the effect that it's had, the positive effect that it's had, and then to look at maybe then revisiting the age to to not automatically, but if it's appropriate, to then raise the age slightly higher. What do you think that time period would look like? So I'm I'm very open-minded to that approach. As I said, I I would urge you as a committee to consider what you think might be an appropriate length of time to test these new systems, to get them robustly in place and working, and to um, have confidence that that step has been a successful step and we're ready to take the next one. I would also ask you to consider what it is we need to monitor, what evidence do we need to gather um, so that we can have confidence and can um, then consider a further step. Okay. If it would be helpful just to add to that briefly, um, if the bill is, is passed, it's certainly in, in, in outline planning terms, the hope is to have uh, most of the scheme up and running towards the end of 2019. Um, and then therefore, it's, it's thinking about what would be a sensible period thereafter, just like 
has happened in relation to the change in prosecution age, what's, what's a kind of critical mass of kind of lived experience and data and evidence? I mean, in relation to the, um, the implementation group arrangements that we've set up in, in, in parallel to the bill processes and in support of them, um, there's, there's, the, there's the kind of the hard science aspect in relation to the challenges that that Mary Fee posed to the Minister around the 12 to 14 cohort, the 14 to 16 cohort, what's the range and what's the severity of the offence referrals and what might be the changes that we see in consequence of the change, um, but also in relation to that, to the victim's perspective and in relation to the, the, you know, the lived experience perspective. I think we, we would want to be gathering kind of metrics around about what had been the impact that we'd seen around the wider confidence around people directly affected by children's behaviour and their own families and folks that would be affected by that directly. I think that a more rounded picture would be needed in order to, to come back to Parliament with um, you know, a fuller perspective on that experience. Um, Fulton McGregor. Well, thanks, Camille. <clears throat> I should probably uh, make a declar declaration of interest um, that I am a registered social worker with the SSC. Good morning, Minister and panel. <coughs> um, just following on from the last line of questioning, so it, it, it does appear that, that one of the major uh, factors in the Minister's um, evidence today for not raising it beyond 12 is about public opinion, um, because like the Minister and like others, I initially would have been um, more keen to see it it been an older age, but, uh, but um, I'm convinced with the evidence around where the public sit as well. So, is the Minister able to say what, what steps would be taken going forward um, in order to um, to help shift the culture in Scotland um, to one that's around a child welfare centred approach um, as opposed to a more punitive approach, and, that, and that's not in terms of the children's hearing system, which I know is a child centred approach, I know from my own experience, but I'm talking about in, in terms of perception, so that if we do come back to review this, if this bill is passed um, into legislation, that, we, um, that, that we're in a position to take the public with us. I think um, you have to take into account that this has been a long, you know, it has been a, a, a long time in Scotland that we've looked at the, you know, the Cabrandon approach, the children's hearing system, that we've looked at children's um, needs, not their deeds. Um, so we have been progressive and ahead of our time in many ways in Scotland. I think in the last 10 years, you've seen a real shift in a real step gear change in the level of progressiveness and, and the, the way that we consider children with harmful behaviour um, and the way that we try to help them through that harmful behaviour. And I think that um, we've seen as a result of leadership um, on that issue, we have seen a change out in, in the population. Um, but we have to be confident. I mean, the, the, we have, there is no getting away from sometimes this behaviour is very, very serious and has very, very serious consequences for um, the victims um, of that harmful behaviour. And in my mind, we have to be confident and they have to be confident that we are moving at the right pace for them and that they will still be able to... Um, that the behaviour will still be responded to appropriately. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Minister, for that. And it is obviously very encouraging that the vast majority of respondents eh, regard that an increase to the age of, age of 12 as appropriate. Eh, my main line of questioning was, was actually around um, the PVG eh, and disclosure scheme. So we heard quite a lot of evidence from various eh, witnesses um, just concerned about um, the, the current system whereby children could perhaps present at hearings on offence grounds and in order to maybe get the hearing eh, over and done with quickly or, or to avoid a stressful situation, um, they, they would accept offence grounds that would later come back to um, impact on them in later life. Can, can you explain how the, uh, how the, the current provisions in this, um, in this bill would, uh, would help that and if there's going to be any changes in that system? 
So I think uh, one of the working groups is, is uh, working particularly on information that's given to um, children. Um, absolutely, they have to have good quality information at the time to make decisions because these these um, these incidents may have a lifelong consequence. And we are very clear that children should be able to move beyond the behaviour that they had, when, which was related to immaturity and, and youth. Um, but perhaps I'll ask my... Um, was it Certainly on the, what, one of you yeah. would like to say a little bit more about um, I, the work I, that I we're doing, the bigger help, picture uh, work uh, that we're doing? Uh, as the Minister outlined in her own evidence, that in, in relation to disclosure matters, um, this bill really um, restricts itself to kind of ancillary changes that flow from the change to 12. But we do recognise that um, there would be a legitimate expectation that the government um, and, and, and the connected agencies would address themselves to the experience for older teenagers. So, for example, um, if you look at this particular bill, um, attends directly to the removal of the offence and the conviction label for under 12s. Um, but if we look forward potentially to the Management of Offenders Bill, that will have far reaching uh, implications potentially for um, the obligation to sell on the child and the young person to self disclose at children's hearings, reducing the journey effectively to zero for children's hearings appearances. And then if you look potentially at the uh, PVG review, and I think there will be more on that in, in the coming weeks. Um, one of the proposals that was contained within that was potentially to extend the role of the independent reviewer to um, all children under 18 who would take that very much, that very individualised, that risk-led approach to how that young person had progressed since the incident that was causing concern and to respond to that um, at the time rather than responding to the concern or the conviction as if it had just happened the previous day. So I think if you connect those three vehicles, if you like, then we're building towards um, a kind of a simplified and a, a, and a more cogent approach to all young people under 18. Sorry, Paul. I wonder if I, if I could add a little bit about the, uh, the collaborative approach, which I think is, um, has been one of the great, um, the, the great um, supportive starting points for this work and accepting the complexities some of the some of the challenges culturally and systematically and in terms of the the public awareness uh, consciousness and support for this kind of work I would I've certainly been reflecting on the evidence from uh, victim support in one of the previous sessions um, in respect of that need to bring uh, to bring victims children families and members of the public um, to, a, to an improved state of awareness on the children's hearing system, on youth justice, on those disclosure points, as you, as you quite rightly say. And I think, there's a, I think we can be reassured that that collaborative approach set up by the advisory group has continued. We have specific working groups looking at issues relating to victims, on disclosure, as Tom outlines, on investigations, which a matter which has been subject of interesting discussion as well. Each of those include um, professional organizations closely connected and responsible for that for that work as well as those um, representing working with with children and each of those groups includes within its work plan the the need to develop um, public facing material age appropriate for material depending on depending on where that work is work is directing very much with that with that broad aim of 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 telling that story again of making sure people understand what the hearing system is is for, how we respond when when things go wrong for children, um, and I think understanding that the re the responsibility is is a is a is a broad one, to say actually, those systems need to be need to be ready, they need to be engaged, and people need to have confidence in them. And if there if the information the explanation isn't there, then we need to improve on that, and that's something that that certainly is is moving forward now. Just one more question. I'm going to um, jump in there, Fulton. No, on listen. the um, independent reviewers' um, functions, we um, know that they might be modified in the, f in the future. Can the minister or officials say a bit more about that, about what um, factors would be taken into consideration? Yeah. Um, 
I guess explicit in the, in, in the title is the expectation that the independent reviewer would operate with a large degree of uh, practice and professional autonomy. Um, there is provision within the bill for ministers, at least initially, um, to provide guidance um, to the, the independent reviewer, because obviously the, there would have to be a first one. Um, but um, I, in keeping with the approach that we've taken to the other challenges around the bill, um, certainly I'm, I'm aware that Disclosure Scotland have been challenged on this from the kind of the broad base of partners that we're working with, from the police perspective, from victims' perspectives, but also from children's rights organisations and others. Um, to work alongside government to build the sort of the initial um, critical mass of what the, the functions would be. I mean, the, essentially, that would be the, the independent reviewer would be uh, empowered to take information from, I think, the, the, the children's reporter, from the local authority, um, from the courts, um, and from anybody else that they deemed appropriate in order to form an appropriate picture in relation to that individual young person and how they'd progressed or otherwise um, in the time since the incident that caused concern. And it would be, I would guess we would take a, a degree of inspiration from the independent monitor function from Northern Ireland and others, and then look to adapt that to align it with the other kind of eternal principles that we have in Scotland to make sure that it, it was in place. But that wouldn't be something that would be done behind closed doors. It's very much a broad-based effort um, with the entire care and justice communities. That's helpful, Fulton. More in question, convener. I wonder if the minister is able to, to comment on trends over time. I know that <clears throat> my own personal experience, when I first started in social work in 2004, um, going to children's hearings, uh, offence grounds were extremely common, and over the years, they just seemed to get less and less by about 2009, 2010. They seemed to have reduced dramatically. Um, are, is the minister able to comment on those trends of children appearing on offence grounds over time and the, the actual use of what, what is disclosed as well? I think, I think that's a really important point because um, really over the last number of years we've been taking a very different approach to um, children and young people, the whole system approach um, which embodies the principles of GERFEC and represents an example of preventative multi-agency approach um, is really about improving outcomes. So there's been fewer children going into the system and being seen at children's hearings than there were um, you know, 10 years ago. Um, and the, the, the children and young people who, who do arrive at um, children's hearing systems, children's hearings on offence grounds are generally at the more complex end and who the children who need our help most. So we've seen that reflected um, in disclosure um, in the last, so let me just, I've got the figures here. So changes from 2014 to 2017. So in the last three years that we have data, there were six convictions accrued when the applicant was under 12. Um, which were disclosed in 2017, that's 92% down from 2014 when there were 79. Um, for the older age group, and I think it's important when we're looking at this bigger picture that we're, we're talking about children under 12 and decriminalising them so that their contact um, is, is not traumatic for them, their contact with their justice system. But the bigger picture is that we do not want children and young people to suffer the consequences of their behaviour um, right through adulthood. So for the older age group, there were 174 convictions accrued when the applicant was um, aged 12 to 15, and which were disclosed in 2017. And that is also down 79% since 2014 when there were 814. So I think that does give you a sense of a much bigger picture of a more progressive needs-based approach. Thanks, that's very helpful. OK, um, Alec Cole-Hamilton. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, I'd like to move on to police powers, but before I do, I'd just like to talk about um, the retrospective qualities of this bill. I, I think it's clear that it will sweep up those uh, young people under 12 who received a criminal record before the bill came into force. But we have just, as a committee, passed a piece of legislation uh, around retrospective offences in the Historic Pardons and Disregards Bill. Um, and that felt like it had uh, more to it in terms of ensuring that uh, 
and disclosures would never be affected by um, offences that are now legal. If we are effectively saying that um, if you committed an offence before you were 12, it shouldn't count, um, what comfort can you give to those young people that they won't have that following them as relevant information on disclosures going forward? Well, I think there's a key difference between um, the situation here and uh, uh, the situation with um, the pardons and disregards, uh, such as for the historic sexual offences. Those offences are no longer offences. Um, what we're doing in this bill is providing that children under 12 can't commit an offence. So it's about the age of the child rather than, than the incident. Um, so I, I think um, we're comfortable with what, what we're doing at the moment. I think it's the right thing to do, but I think there's a significant difference between those two situations. I, I think the, the catalyst for bringing this legislation forward was that despite the fact that the Scottish Government had increased the age of criminal prosecution to 12 some time ago, there was still um, a propensity or a likelihood that young people would carry a criminal record from before the age of 12 for the rest of their life, and that would impede their chances going forward. I would put it to you, Minister, that having relevant information disclosed on a disclosure for something you did when you were eight, uh, which can still happen as a re result of this um, legislation, would still impede your chances going forward. If we, if we agree that young people do not have mental capacity to be held responsible for that, how is that fair or justified? I think you'll see in, in that section of the bill there's a really tight safeguards and it's not that all. the presumption is that information won't be released. It'll only be released when there is really considered to be a risk to public safety if that information is not released. Um, so I am comfortable that that will be an extremely rare set of circumstances that anything goes on to an ORI um, for a child um, under 12 test for that be set? I mean, where, where will, who will determine the bar for what, where there's a reasonable assessment that there is a risk to public safety of that information being included? It, 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 it will be a function that's given to the independent reviewer, the bill. Um, uh, so the, the, the current system for assessment of inclusion of, of other relevant information on a disclosure certificate as this would fall to be. Um, it, it lies with the Chief Constable. Um, that, would, that would still be the case. The Chief Constable would, would still require to assess whether the information is relevant to the purpose of the disclosure certificate. So whether it's relevant in the circumstances of that particular certificate that this information goes on to the certificate and whether it ought to be disclosed. So that's a statutory test currently. In addition to that statutory test, if the Chief Constable considers there is relevant information which ought to be disclosed in respect of under 12 behaviour, um, that information would, would go to the independent reviewer. And again, that assessment would be carried out, but with uh, the independent reviewer has a wider, um, will have wider access to information. Um, the bill gives the independent reviewer specific authority to request information from a wider group of people than will be available to the Chief Constable. The independent review of, will also have the benefit of guidance um, on how to apply th that statutory test. Okay. Would, would it be helpful just to add to that, that briefly yeah. around the, the, the current experience and, and the operation of the ORI scheme at the moment? Um, my understanding is that through the application of their own quality assurance framework, Police Scotland actually haven't disclosed any other relevant information in respect of under 12s at all and I think that's because they're particularly mindful of the maturation and the adolescence process um, but um, the distinct the other distinction that I suppose that we would draw to the pardons and disregards bill is that, 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 that there's been a, a kind of a really kind of mindful um, working through of the, the various perspectives and experiences around about how we should look back on previous behaviour, childhood behaviour that was previously dealt with as offending. Um, I suppose the distinction here is that while we're looking to give really close attention to the life chances and the disclosure issues, because as you said, Mr Colwell, we weren't looking for that to follow children and young people into adulthood, but I suppose what we were also mindful of was that we're not, um, we're not minimising or disregarding the harm that was done to other victims when the behaviour occurred, many of whom were of course children themselves, because again, I think that's the evidence that for childhood um, 
harmful behaviour oftentimes that, that that's impacting on other children. So while we were making sure that um, the, the stigma wasn't following young people into adulthood, but we weren't at the same time um, making a signal to victims and other observers that this was no longer a behaviour that was of concern, because I think that that would still be the case. Just ask it, and you said there, there hasn't been information um, disclosed before, but just for the, the benefit of the committee, what sort of thing would be, what would the, what's, you know, what would a scenario be where that would, would be deemed usual to, or in the public interest to? Well, the other relevant information, um, I, I would guess that that would, that would include contextual material around concerns that had been raised about an individual or reports that had been made about an individual that um, may or may not have resulted in proceedings and or a finding at a children's hearing or a conviction. Um, but the police very carefully um, apply their own quality assurance framework and it's very much an independent chief constable statutory function. Um, about what they think would be most relevant for a third party, most likely a prospective employer, to be aware of. Um, so they would have that would only apply to, to higher level disclosures as well. So the other aspect that they would be very mindful of was what would be the vulnerability? What's the role that's being applied for by that young person or older young person who had this conduct in their background? Are they looking to look work with particularly vulnerable groups and therefore what what, what might not be relevant for other more kind of common or garden roles might become very, very relevant if somebody was looking to work with vulnerable groups, for example. Um, but we can certainly look to see if we can reach out to Police Scotland and see if we can provide some exemplars for you about what, what might be included there. Sorry, I'll be Thank you, convener. Um, if I can move on to... Uh, the section 23 um, which is the sort of powers of the police and uh, particularly the powers to take children under 12 to a place of safety an anxiety that myself and other colleagues have carried really since the publication of the bill was that um, the only place of safety that actually appears on the face of the bill is the least desirable place of safety which is a police station and anyone who's been to a police station on a friday or saturday night would say it's pretty pretty far from being a, a place of safety it also speaks i think to the testimony we heard from lindsay hanvidge that that was the default position they came to and that she actually ended up in the cells and when we question police scotland about this they say that occasionally children will be housed in cells um for want of somewhere else to take them um does the minister agree that we perhaps need to amend this section to first of all identify the the places of safety that should be tried first and also perhaps that this section presents an opportunity to create um, a, an additional clause for children over the age of 12 who are not yet 18 um, ar around the use of cells in the police estate? So, um, these provisions allow an exceptional response to an exceptional situation that's not routine at all. The place of safety will only be used where there's an immediate risk of harm or further harm, and it'll only be used for the shortest period possible. And it really is a genuine place of safety. It's not about um, taking the child away and questioning them or um, interrogating them. It's about providing an emergency space um, for them to cool off. Um, the place of safety in most cases will be the child's home. You know, that's a very obvious place um, for, for children to go. Um, the, it could be another home, it could be a friend's home, a relative's home, it could be a children's home. Um, the, you know, the places of, these places of safety are named in, um, you know, they're regularly used in, in, uh, in other situations. Um, as a Highlands and Islands representative, you'll understand, I, I can understand your concern about the police station being there as a last resort, but as a representative um, for an extremely vast and rural area, I can conceive of the situation where out of hours there is no other place of safety that a child can be removed to without removing them for hundreds of miles, which is also traumatic. So I think it does need to be in there as a last resort. Um, we're not, um, it won't be used routinely. As I said, the first place of safety will be the child's home. Thank you for that, Minister. Um, I understand 
um, the, the need to include the possibility as a very, very last resort of taking a child to a police station in the context you describe. My anxiety is if, if it is the only place of safety defined on the face of the bill, it runs the risk of becoming the default. Not only that, but without any detail as to what conditions the young person uh, should be held in when they are taken to that place of safety and uh, tool of last resort, you run the risk of seeing them spending a night in their cells. And that happens. And we, we heard that from Lindsay Hambridge. We heard, we heard it from Police Scotland. Do you not think that amendment is required to specifically, A, delineate the other places of safety, as is defined in other acts, that children might be taken to first? And secondly, the conditions and, and the operational parameters of what would happen when you get, to the, get a child to the police station and what you need to do on the face of the bill? Do you want to come in on this? Definitions the point, um, if, it, if it would assist at all. Section 23, subsection 8 contains the definition of a place of safety and it and it does it by reference to a provision that's in the Children's Hearing Scotland Act. So that's a that's a, just a very common way of legislation, as you'll know, um, uh, of, of cross-referring. And the detailed provision about uh, uh, the, the list of, 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 there are six places listed in the Children's Hearing Scotland Act. Um, which uh, one of which is a police station. So um, I think in terms of whether there's a need to have that on the face of the bill, it, 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 in legislative terms, it is there already. Um, it might also be worth um, just on the on the, your question about about children um, of, of higher age. It might be just be worth um, bearing in mind that what the Children's Hearing Scotland Act itself says on this. Um, so section 189 of the Children's Hearing Scotland Act places a restriction on the use of police stations as a place of safety, similar to the restriction that's contained in section 23 on the use of places of safety. So uh, so that it is clear for for children under 12 being dealt with under the, under this bill and other children uh, who will be dealt with by the children's hearing system that that restriction on the use of police stations that's been enforced since June 2013 is in place worked very closely with your colleagues yes. on the development of that yes. um, piece of legislation. Um, and it was to that that I was referring in terms of the, the actual uh, list of other places of safety that might be taken. My concern is that we're dealing with this bill. And uh, yes, I, I don't agree with over-legislating, and, and that's fine if there's a, a, a done way of doing things. But still, neither in the Children's Hearings Bill nor in this bill are there clear um, statutory parameters for the use of particularly the cell estate um, in police stations. And I go back to Lindsay Hanridge and the fact that this country did her a profound disservice. And at the age of 13, nothing in this bill would have stopped that happening. Um, I think we clearly need to act on that. And I think there needs to be provision in this bill to make it clear that, that no child should ever be in, put in place in a cell. That's a direct infringement of their Article 37 rights. Um, and, and I'll be seeking amendment to that end. If I can move on, convener. With your... I'm just jumping Sorry. briefly yes, on, on that. Um, you mentioned there that, it, it, uh, Minister, that it was um, quite rare for children to be need to be taken to a place of safety. Can you provide the committee with um, numbers and uh, a, an indication of under what circumstances they're taken to a place of safety? And of that number, how many would go to a police station? It's difficult to see um, in terms of numbers. I mean, we're talking about a very small number of children in a year um, it, it, with regards to this bill, a handful, you know, um, and not all of those would need to be taken to a place of safety. So they wouldn't, they wouldn't meet the test of there being an immediate risk of harm. Um, the circumstance, we thought hard about the circumstances. As I said, I would expect the place of safety to be the child's home in almost all cases. Um, and I think that would be what most of us would expect. We've tried to think hard of the circumstances where that might not be a safe place to take the child. And, and I guess, you know, in the, in the very early stages after something terrible has happened, so for example, a child in the family has died and it's not clear they have died as a result of somebody's harmful behaviour, but it's not clear whose behaviour has um, has made you know has caused that there ha 
might potentially be the situation where another child in the family is being implicated by parents, but the police, for example, are wondering whether that is correct or whether the parents themselves might not be responsible. And in that situation, clearly, the home is not a safe place to take that child. And until the, you know, the, the child has to be removed at, from the danger to the place of safety, and further arrangements need to be made as rapidly as possible for that child while the facts of the case are established. I suppose I would comment or ask for, for your reflection on if the, if the overriding purpose of the bill is to not criminalise children, is there a risk that the provisions in there around place of safety kind of rub against that ethos and, and how, how would we let children and their families know that they, they weren't being criminalised if they're going to a police station? So I can, I mean, as I say, oh, oh, I can ab it is absolutely as a last resort that that is there as a place of safety. And I can envisage, I mean, it, we're talking about a handful of cases in a year, but I can envisage the situation where a, a, a child would have to be transported hundreds of miles away to get to a suitable place of safety, which is also a traumatic experience for them. Um, and I think it is useful to have it there, but it, I cannot envisage the situation where it would be used, um, except in the most rare, rare of circumstances. It's an exceptional response to an exceptional situation. Thank you for that example. A really final line of questioning for me um, on this section, just in, in terms of the uh, investigative interview sections of the bill, um, section 38 affords children the right to not, the right not to answer questions. Um, picked up a, a feeling from some of the witnesses that we interviewed about this, that actually that, that, that doesn't meet the test of Article 40 obligations, and, and actually that the rights to adult suspects are, are sort of more um, robust than this in terms of the, the right to silence is, is different than the right not to answer questions. Tell me what happened is an instruction, it's not a question, and nothing about this bill would preclude um, a, a, an interviewing officer from making that instruction. Do we need to improve that? Um, I mean, I think that to put this in the context, that an interview is not going to happen in every situation. Again, it's going to, these are, uh, all of the provisions of the bill are, are exceptional circumstances for exceptional situations. Um, in order for an interview to happen, there has to be reasonable grounds to suspect that the child was responsible. It has to be necessary to interview the child, um, to properly investigate the child's behaviour. They have to apply to a sheriff. There's a number of safeguards in place around the interview. And one of those safeguards is that the child will have a right to a supporter, and that supporter will be both legally qualified and an advocate, independent advocacy worker. We were very keen, we looked very closely at the issue of what kind of person did we think should be there supporting the child. And in order to protect their rights, we do think that they need to be legally qualified. I think Gail Ross was going to pick up on advocacy. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Thanks, Convener. Um, I, I'm, I'm glad you touched on that, Minister, because um, when we took evidence about the, um, the proposal that the advocacy workers must be legally qualified, there was some confusion as to why that would be and what it actually means. Um, the Law Society of Scotland said we would question how these rights will operate when considering the rights to legal advice provided under the equivalent criminal proceedings. And the Scottish Independent Advocacy Alliance said that it's vital that independent advocacy is not seen or used as a substitute for legal representation or the appropriate adult scheme. So can you explain to the committee um, why these advocacy services will require to be legally qualified? need to provide robust protection of the child's rights throughout the interview process. That's why we think they need to be legally qualified. Um, the, what the child says and does during that interview may well have lifelong consequences for them, and I think it's really important that their rights are protected in that situation. But equally important is that the child has um, a, a, a proportionate child-centred response 
um, to to them. So advocacy is as important um, as as the legal qualification, and and, and we think that this. Um, provides protection on both fronts, so protection of robust, protection of their rights, but also um, a child-centred voice um, for for the individual. I don't know if either of um, my officials would like to add to that. If it would help at all, um, I, th I think the manner in which you introduced the challenge was, was really helpful, because um, while the Law Society evidence referred to the equivalent, the equivalent criminal proceedings, um, I think the, the entire premise of, of, of this particular proposal within the bill is that it signally would not be equivalent to criminal proceedings. And, and what we'll be talking about here is um, drawing on and then supporting an existing cohort of um, legally qualified solicitors, obviously, who are already operating on the Children's Legal Assistance Scheme, so they'd already been required to demonstrate that capacity for child-centred practice, and that they have a quality assurance mechanism in place in relation to that, and they already have the wider obligations and assurance that's offered by you know, that professional solicitor status uh, and that oversight. Um, but they would also be able to operate um, um, on that very child-focused, child-centred way. Um, so it's, a, it's about appropriately skilled individuals who have behind them that appropriately kind of robust set of quality assurance mechanisms, but it doesn't feel like a proxy for a duty solicitor. It very much feels like someone who has that expertise and those skills to call on, but is able to deploy them in an appropriate and in an accessible way, both for a child and for the supporter, but also in terms of holding the other adult actors in the room to account about the focus of the interview, that this is about finding what are the circumstances, yes, of the concern and behaviour, but what are the underlying needs and risks that have, that have, that have played into that? And let's remind ourselves that while there might remain a right to remain silent, it's actually probably better to come forward and talk about your experience, talk about your concerns, talk about what's led to that incident or series of incidents, so that we can put the place, uh, put in place the right sorts of supports round about you. And this isn't about you being in trouble. So, in terms of the numbers of people that are already undertaking this role, that are, are legally qualified, essentially solicitors, but with a child-centred focus, the advocacy support workers that we're using currently that don't have a, a, a legally qualified background, are we going to upskill them? Are we making sure that they are going to go through this training to become legally qualified? Or do we have enough of a cohort at present? It, it there are a number of potential cohorts on which we could draw. As I said, the, the, the Children's Legal Assistance Scheme has 700 solicitors on it across Scotland. Um, and if you look, for example, at the National Safeguarders Panel, who already operate in children's hearings, there are about 160 of them. About 40% of them are legally qualified. So they're, uh, I guess what we would be looking to do is, is, is to build an environment whereby um, people could access the right sorts of learning and development pathways and accrue the right sorts of qualifications and skills and knowledge in order to meet the need, whether or not that be in a child, an investigative interview, in the conversations with families in between, or at a pre-hearing panel, or at a children's hearing, or at a connected sheriff court proceeding. And the other uh, virtue of the proposal that, that the Minister set out for you is that um, if we were to draw on the Children's Legal Assistance Scheme members, what that would mean is that the same individual could, obviously in the sorts of emergency circumstances we're talking about, there wouldn't be that really important beneficial relationship-based um, advocacy that, that you would like to have because it would just be um, arriving very quickly. But what that would mean is that the relationship with that individual practitioner could continue with the child if matters were to go on to a hearing and they could perhaps continue as a legal rep. Okay, um, so you're comfortable that the amount um, of 20,600 in the financial memorandum is enough for a fully accessible, legally qualified advocacy service? Yes, and, and the, oh, as, as we work through, um, 
as you've mentioned yourself, about the, the importance of um, learning and development, quality assurance and oversight. We're working through that with the Independent Advocacy Alliance, with the Law Society, with Child Law, um, and with our kind of, uh, the, the wider sort of advocacy sector. Um, and, and they've agreed to kind of help us with the detail of that, and that will just emerge over the coming months. I think the other the other thing to that's important to emphasise is that this is about to be subject of consultation. And I think, in terms of the question on on the rights which attach that that you quite rightly bring up, this has really been about offering another uh, another tool in the box, another another opportunity to get the the right people in the room at, at that moment at that moment where those. Uh, where crisis has been has been responded to from the emergency position, and where there's now an opportunity for a different sort of conversation, so we, it's about making sure the right specialist support is ac is accessed by the child, that the best people are there to help them through that difficulty, to address their needs, and what legal qualifications look like in that context is is about to be the subject of consultation. Because whilst whilst there's there there may well be consequences from that, they're no longer a criminal suspect. And the authenticity of that change has got to be reflected in a different set of rights being attached and re responded and respected. And I think that part of that, com that shared conversation has been, has been really to come up with the best answer for that. So this, this specialist advocacy role for that very narrowly defined set of circumstances can be, can be fulfilled by an existing cohort. And, we'll, and we're, we'll, we look forward to the consultation to see what the next steps might be. Specific point, Paul. Can you tell me um, what form that consultation is going to take? What the time scale for it is, and who's going to be consulted? Actually, my, my colleague. <laughs> Apologies. So I think it's just been fairly re late, lately that ministers have agreed to this, but the, the plan certainly is to 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 go public in, in relation to the consultation before Christmas, um, and I think importantly. Well, we, as Paul said, we wanted to delineate the, the really acute rights challenges that notwithstanding the child-centred, hopefully, focus of the investigative interviews conversation, that we wanted to um, relate that in broader terms to the Section 122 of the 2011 Act, Children's Hearings Act, wider Children's Hearings Advocacy Service, and to invite views on what we thought we'd identify as really broad areas of commonality there around having a kind of that relationship-based approach, um, but also to identify and to invite views on the particular points of difference. So we would be consulting on particular aspects of the draft practice model that we've worked on with the advocacy sector, um, along with the specifics that would flow from these new proposals within within the bill and, um, and, and put that context together to um, a public consultation l um, later in the year. Thanks. Okay. Annie Wells. You know, good morning, Minister. Good morning, morning panel. Um, in the Minister's opening remarks, she spoke about support for victims. Um, and my question is, does the Minister believe that, as the bill set, sits just now, that it does protect the rights of <coughs> and the interests of children who have who have um, been involved in harmful behaviour and also to the victims of that harmful behaviour? Yeah, I, I think it, it's a really important question and thank you for asking it. I think that victims are absolutely at the heart of this bill in a number of ways. So we've recognised that the children who are involved in harmful behaviour are absolutely often victims of other people's harmful behaviour. They're some of the most vulnerable citizens that we have in Scotland. And the way that we respond to them in this crisis can help to turn their lives around. So they are undoubtedly victims. The victims of their behaviour are also at the heart of this bill. If you, um, when you speak to victims, the thing that they want most is for nobody else to have to go through what they have gone through themselves. And at the heart of this bill is a progressive aim to try to turn the lives around of some of these um, most vulnerable citizens who have landed in crisis. And the aim is for there to be fewer victims in future because of the way that we respond to their behaviour. So I think victims are at the very heart of this bill. Um, and, and I hope that you would agree they're you know, threaded right through it. Um, thank you very much. Um, during the evidence session from victim support, we did hear sort of a, some concerns that 
some of the victims of this harmful behaviour weren't receiving information as to what happened to the person who caused the harmful behaviour. And I think in some instances, in some circumstances, that helps that person who has been the victim to heal as well, knowing that something has been done and they have been taken that's been taken into account. So are we are we content that the information that's given to the victims by the principal reporter is only when it's of a serious case or should it be should we have to look at that more about what information is shared? I mean, I think I think you're right, there's a balance to be struck, isn't there? So I think it's um, really absolutely appropriate that victims get appropriate support and information. Um, but there has to be a number of safeguards in there, and I think we have struck the balance appropriately in, in this bill on, on that issue. Um, the, you know, we can't be releasing information in inappropriate circumstances about essentially children, and as we, you know, we all agree that bo both um, perpetrator and victim are are victims um, often in these circumstances. Um, the principal reporter has to take, and I mean, again, I refer back to this child-centred approach that we have. They have to take into account um, the best interests of the child. I don't know if one of um, my officials would like to add a little bit more about if, the information. That's right. I mean, I, I suppose the provisions, the victim information provisions within the bill are in, uh, are in large part about um, reintroducing the, um, the, the Children's Reporter Victim Information Service because when you lose the offence label, um, the, the power of the principal reporter to provide information kind of hinged on that, so we had to kind of um, build that afresh. But um, I, I guess it's implicit within your own question, in order for information and support to be meaningful, that should probably be understood as a backstop because the information that is provided for in the bill is relatively minimal. And that's mainly because of the vulnerability of the children who are thought to be responsible. But in order to be of most use to victims, then that needs to be seen in terms of the wider efforts through the, the delivery groups. Um, and I think one of the, um, the main benefits of um, developing the bill has been tho making those connections afresh between the police, between the children's reporter, with Victim Support Scotland, and recognising the importance of, actually, it needs to be round about first contact, whether or not that is with the police or with a third sector provider, or indeed with the reporter service themselves. Um, certainly the experience of the Victim Information Service as it's been operating since 2003 seems to be that if um, there's an opportunity to have a conversation with victims to say that, look, th this has been given attention to by the appropriate agencies, um, but as you know, um, there will be things going on within the family that aren't connected to the specific incident that we can't tell you everything about, and the panel will look at that in much more detail. So we really appreciate that um, we have to give attention to those in order to attend to the wider risks. But in terms of what we're able to tell you and your family, it will be quite limited because it's a child. Um, and that seems to have been reasonably well understood and reasonably well received. And it, it's, a, it's, an, a, it's a fair and it's an honest calibration of a reconciliation, rather, um, of the various competing interests in play. And I think that the, 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 there's a real appetite to refocus on that and make sure that um, the bill provisions are what they are but they should be, I guess, the, the last chapter in a more meaningful and um, a more regularised contact with victims that provides more um, tailored information to them about the principles that we're um, deploying there. Thank you, convener. Thank you. Um, Mary Fee has been waiting very patiently to come back in. So you have Thank a you um, very much, um, convener. I've got a couple of um, follow-up questions. The first is on place of safety, and it follows up from the line of questioning from um, Alex Gold Hamilton. Um, the bill, as has been explained to us, uses the definition of place of safety from the Children's Hearings Scotland 2011 Act. And in the policy um, document accompanying the bill, there are six, it lists six places that the Children's Hearing Act recommend as a place of safety. Can you explain to me then, if there are six listed in the policy document, why you chose to lift the police station and put that on the face of the bill and not use one of the other examples? I think Liz tried to address that point in her earlier response, so um, I'll ask Liz no. to answer it. I, I think it, 
So there are six places li listed mm -hmm. as a place of safety and uh, in the Children's Hearings Act um, and in the definition. And there is specific provision, separate provision, um, in the Children's Hearings Act that places the specific restriction on the use of police stations. So, the, so in effect, what, um, what this bill is doing is, is effectively replicating that dual provision. So we have the, we have the six, six places and then we have the specific restriction on the face of the, of the bill as to the use of police stations. No, I'm, I'm sorry. I mean, I, I might be being quite um, naive or stupid. I, I, I don't know. But there is a list of six places and the one place that's been lifted and put in the face of the bill is police station. Why didn't, for example, you lift a residential or other establishment provided by a local authority? Why did you not lift that one? I, I, There's no restriction being required to yeah. be placed on that. The, 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 the specific provision in section 23 that, that, it, that was required to be made as regards a police, uh, use of a police station mm. was to place this specific restriction on the use of a police station. There, was, there isn't an, a similar need to place a restriction on the use of any of the other places of safety. So that's why this specific provision required to be made and it had to be made on the face of this bill. The Minister's wanting to come in on this. If I can reassure you, I mean, we, we believe that, that all of that is captured with the wording. It's simply a, a, a convention in drafting. If you would prefer the full wording to be on the face of the bill, we're perfectly comfortable with that. C can, can I move on just... Um... Just going to bring in Oliver Mundell because okay. I realise he didn't get to his his question there. Uh, thank you very much, convener. It was uh, just on a sort of technical point. I don't know if uh, the minister had seen Professor Sutherland's evidence uh, last week, just around uh, some issues on offence grounds, which I think the Law Society had also uh, highlighted in uh, their written evidence. And it was just whether uh, the minister had had a chance to to reflect on that at all. We, we watched that evidence and we have discussed it. I'll ask my official poll to respond to you. Yeah, it's, it, it, was an interesting, it was an interesting exchange and um, it harked back to some of, the, some of the written evidence as well. I think um, it's, important to, it's important to understand the, the context and consequences that we're, that we're potentially looking at here. Firstly, in, in emphasising the, the decriminalisation of, um, of, this, of this work by removing the offence ground there are consequences in terms of the, the standard of proof, so on and so forth. And, and as I mentioned before, the rights protections which attach therefore are, are different. And, and the evidence that, that, that you heard um, reflected back to, to some concern about, about rep replication of that. I think the, the first thing to say is that um, I know from my own professional experience that the, uh, in, 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 terms of, in terms of understanding how the characteristics of, of children, young people, victims, witnesses are taken into account in, in decision making. We can have um, we can have confidence of the the factors as um, publicly available in the prosecution code for for older children, so on and so forth. That um, those characteristics are always taken into account when it comes to the use of the the referral ground. It's a re it's already practice just now that um, if if a a piece of offending behaviour as part of a broader, a broader need that can be weft into that. There's case case law which prohibits the use of the offence ground um, for, uh, sorry, the use of the use of non-offence ground for offence only behaviour, which is then which is then addressed within this bill uh, positively. The um, the first thing I think the other thing to say is that it's not actually required. When we look at twelve. The work from through the advisory group and thereafter has been confident that any incident of harmful behaviour can appropriately be addressed, taking into account the the, the broader non-offence grounds, and that um, any any incident of harmful behaviour can be can be can be responded to in that child-focused manner, and the provisions in the bill provide the rights-based safeguards, taking into account that change to the standard of proof. I think it's it's fair to emphasise that with the child no longer being a criminal suspect, they are. They, they need to be seen in a different context, and replicating criminal procedure is is uh, is not quite in line with that with that underlying principle of decriminalisation. Um, it's important, of course, that the, those rights-based safeguards are put in place for for all of the actors throughout the different stages. Um, if you look at the way the way that the offence ground the offence ground operates just now, as I say, it's quite narrowly defined. Reflecting on that evidence. 
one can see, particularly in the Police Scotland submission, the thought about operating a higher age and a review clause and so on might need to be looked at again. And I think that would that would include discussion about whether whether those those grounds would continue to exist. But at under 12, I think we can be confident that that um, that there should that there shouldn't be a gap in that regard. And I think Professor Sullivan had mentioned that there were talks uh, around <coughs> maybe creating a new referral ground or a new category of referral grounds. Uh, why, why, why was that approach uh, ruled out? Well, as I say, um, because, it, because, it, because it isn't necessary for, for under 12. For under 12. Because, because the other grounds, particularly uh, m and I think it is, in terms of a child presenting a risk to others or being out of the control of the, um, of the relevant person, I think those those grounds and and others, if 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 required, can be used to capture all of those all of those instances. There's there's a clear message of reassurance that there's that it that it's it, it wouldn't add any additional benefit. So um, I guess I guess uh, from from what you're saying, and I, and I, I I I do understand that. But why, as an expert in the field like Professor Sutherland and the Law Society of Scotland? raising concerns about this if it's not an issue? What, where, where do you think their concern is coming from? Sorry. Um, it, it would help to reflect back on the broad base of expertise that we drew on in relation to the advisory group that included children's rights organisations, that included representatives from the legal profession, that included independent academia. and. Um, in a context where you already have 17 available grounds for referral, um, and as Paul had mentioned, although you, you used the letters, um, there's, there, there's an available ground of referral that specifically turns on children's conduct having an adverse effect on other people, and there's another ground that specifically turns on children being beyond parental control. Um, our own legal analysis, um, our own policy consideration, and more importantly, that broader group of care and justice experts led us to the position where we thought we had confidence that there was a sufficient capacity within the available grounds to deal with, uh, certainly all under 12 behaviour, yeah. Mary. Thank you very much, um, convener. J just for c completeness, um, Minister, in your um, opening remarks and in your answers to a number of my um, colleagues' questions, you, you talked about the very small number of um, children that, that commit very serious crimes. Can you tell me how many children commit those very serious crimes and what those very serious crimes are? Yes, certainly I can. Um, there, I'll just, um, as I said, it's a very, very small number of children that we are talking about. Um, in terms of the children's hearing referrals to the reporter by age group, there's 232 children aged 8 to 11 that are referred currently in 2017 18. Very serious crimes because yeah, there, there is a range so of offences. So I'm just so going on to that if you'll allow me to finish. Okay. okay. So, 232 children aged 8 to 11 referred on offence grounds. 12 children aged 8 to 11 referred for serious violent or sexual offences. And 42 children aged 8 to 11 referred for weapons offences. Does that answer your question? Answers that question, yep. Uh -huh. um, last week, um, in, in our evidence um, session, we were, we were talking about the, the, the needs-based approach. And, and, and Garfek, and it's, it's something that, that you've spoken about as well, you've also spoken um, about the fact that, that many children, young people that are involved in, in criminal behaviour or activity, come from either care experienced or very disruptive traumatic backgrounds, and they are victims themselves. And one of our um, panel members last week said that the question we should be asking young children when they are involved in this activity isn't what have you done, it's what's been done to you. Do you think this bill will meet that need? Yes, absolutely. And that's the absolute fundamental of the children's hearing system as well in Scotland. So the children's hearing system asks us to look at children's needs, not their <coughs> deeds, to shift from the what have you done to what has happened to you. And I think I can assure you that this is part of a bigger picture towards that approach. 
Okay. Well, thank you very much for your evidence this morning, Minister, and your officials. We will briefly suspend while we change panels.
Okay, welcome back. We now move into our second um, panel item of business today, which is an evidence session on scrutiny of the 2019-2020 draft budget. Today we have a panel of local authority experts, uh, witnesses, looking at how equality and human rights approaches can be taken in local government budgeting. So can I welcome Councillor Jennifer Layden, City convener for Equalities and Human Rights at Glasgow City Council, Louise McKenzie, Group Manager for Strategic Policy and Planning at Glasgow City Council, Rosemary McKinnon, Principal Officer for Equality at Highland Council, Audrey Cameron, Development Officer for Equalities at North Lanarkshire Council, and Liz Fergus, Youth Work Manager for North Lanarkshire Council. You're all very welcome this morning. Um, can I start things off by asking um, what methods you use within your local authorities to undertake equality impact assessments? Um, can we hear a bit about what evidence is considered and who's consulted, please? And I'll go to whoever makes eye contact with me first. <laughs> who's ready? <laughs> Audrey, are you wanting to come in? Mm. The approach that North Lanarkshire Council um, took, particularly in the 2018-19 um, um, budget, was to um, consider equalities um, groups within the, uh, the proposals that were um, originally being made. And the proposals for the 2018 budget um, took place in August 2017. So at that point, when the um, sort of corporate management team um, and heads of service were considering what the budget proposals would be, um, a pro forma was um, developed that um, asked specific questions around who the budget would impact on. Would it be um, service users, employees, um, and um, other services, what, um, if it impacted on other services as well? Um, and then drilled that down a bit to, to a follow-up question. Um, and if it impacted on any of the service users or staff, what protected characteristics um, of the quality act that particularly um, a budget proposal impacted upon? Um, so uh, so that, that was kind of like a screening process, I suppose, at a very, very early stage um, of that budget setting process. And that was obviously like just proposals at that point. And that was used as a basis for um, future discussions with elected members um, and that formed the basis as well of for, I can speak about within my own service which was education youth and communities um, and we took an overview of all of the um, th those proposals that were being made for our service um, and looked at an accumulative effect um, on particular groups so we identified um, particularly in, in relation to 2018-19 that um, the young people, obviously it's an education, youth and community service, so that was a bit of an um, um, obvious one, but we looked at, um, a, we, we thought that we needed to keep an eye on um, young people who had additional support needs, young people um, who had communication support needs and young people's um, mental health. That was the kind of the, the issues that were coming up as those original proposals. Um, the, that process then went out to public consultation, um, and um, there was a that the public consultation took a form of um, a, through an internet email consultation, focus groups. Um, there was twenty five articles in the local press. Um, hard copies were put in the libraries, and we had specific. Um, consultation um, focus group with the British Sign Language community and also with young people. Liz might be able to speak a bit about that, about, about the, the young people. Um, what I'll maybe do is bring in some of the other local authorities and then we can get into that. <laughs> Who else would like to come in? <laughs> um, Jennifer. Happy to come in. Um, well, in terms of our, our budget process, uh, there was a number of different strands that took place uh, simultaneously. Um, for my, myself, um, I was part of a budget subgroup with, along with the Treasurer, along with another colleague who met with directors of service to discuss through budget proposals. Um, and that allowed us to, you know, for me to specifically ask about equalities aspects. Um, some of our budget proposals as well, we, we went out to public consultation. Um, we went out and had a number of community events and online dialogue tool. And we also spoke to equalities groups within the city. So, for example, the Glasgow Disability Alliance to get their feedback on the types of um, 
issues and, and gaps that we had in our budget and where we could perhaps make savings. As part of our, our meetings, um, we also undertook um, a quality impact assessments for our draft budget. Um, so on our budget day for our field council, we had four budgets uh, presented, four draft budgets from all the parties, and each had an equality impact assessment that came along with that. Um, so we were very strong in bringing that and making sure that that was through the entire process. Thank you. Um, um, yes. I, I'll just maybe follow on some of the points that um, Councillor Layden has made. Um, I mean, what's really important, I think, in our approach is, is the strong political leadership um, that's there. Um, and in terms of the consultation process, as Councillor Layden had mentioned, we had a number of community um, consultation events. We made sure we have, we're lucky in Glasgow, I suppose, we have a, a strong and thriving um, equality third sector. Um, and a lot of those groups um, were present at those consultation events, which were held in different three different sectors of the city. In addition, um, to reach beyond that, we had um, we have a Glasgow household survey, which is a thousand a panel of a thousand re residents. It's weighted um, to reflect the makeup of the city, and we conducted focus groups um, drawn from that panel to discuss again the budget um, options and ideas that were coming through. Um, as Councillor Layden has mentioned, the quality impact assessment work was done, um, and it's done um, following a mainstreaming model. It's done by the services who are looking at the options. Um, in addition, though, um, for the new administration of the council, as well as councillors receiving mandatory equality training to, to cover um, the act and the public sector equality duty, there's also been a programme of equality impact assessment training, which is carried out by the, the corporate team and which uh, Council Lead will vouch for is a fairly practical session. <laughs> so I think that's, that's really helped to understand what members are required to do. Um, training and, and stuff yeah. like that okay. later. Thank I'd be you. interested to hear a perspective from Highland. Thanks very much. Uh, yes, I, I suppose we have some similarities in approaches to both Glasgow and, and North Lanarkshire in terms of our approaches, in particular the use of a pro forma template which asks um, about um, the protected characteristics and the, and the likely impact at an early stage uh, is identified and, and highlighted before proposals go forward. Um, and that's taken through if, uh, if a full impact assessment is identified as being needed, that will be carried out uh, and um, presented to, to members. Uh, in terms of engagement, we've used a range of different forms of engagement over the years. Um, some of that online, we've, we've worked with local communities, whether that's community councils, uh, ward forums, um, and we have um, carried out consultation with particular groups with an interest in equality uh, and access issues. And in particular, we, we've, we've tried to work with groups who maybe um, find it more difficult to use traditional me methods of engagement so um, uh, we have worked with people with learning disabilities, people affected by mental health issues, um, people with visual or, or hearing impairments, and carried out particular focus groups with, with those groups, in addition to the wider range of groups that we engage with. Uh, where we do carry out surveys, whether they're online or whether it's paper format or through citizens' panels, we also disaggregate information by, in particular, disability uh, and gender and age to give us some information and while generally it tends to be um, feedback that we, we get um, it's aligned with the feedback we get from the general population but sometimes it does give us some very rich insights into the differences uh, uh, different views from some of those groups okay thank you that's helpful My colleague Gail Ross wanted to ask about equality training um, yeah just uh, before I go on to the training um, good morning panel thank you all for coming along um, in terms of the, the, the focus groups and the citizens panel and the disability and you know whoever else that you consult with when you're, you're, you're doing these um, impact assessments, if it comes forward that there is going to be quite a severe um, equalities or human rights impact, is that um, suggestion or uh, part of the budget immediately dropped? Or is it put to elected members and, and, and they decide if it goes through? How does that work if, if you find out that, that a piece of work is going to have a severe impact on a certain group? Example around um, 
one of the, the budget priorities in North Lanarkshire last, last year that was up for consultation was the closure of our outdoor centre in Kobawi and Oban. And um, there was a very strong um, reaction from our, our local young people and who were supported through um, making their, their views heard around the fact that the impact that Kilbowie had on them um, growing up, if, no matter what age the young person was, you know, everyone talked about, you know, their week at Kilbowie with school and um, the young people were, were really felt strong that that was impacting on, you know, their learning experiences going forward and that was put, all that information was put to committee so that, that proposal was then taken off the table and Kilbowie wasn't indeed shut down. So that would be a, a very practical example of you said we did um, kinda in terms of our young people. That's good. Any other feedback from that? You know, I think to just to come in on that, we would follow a similar process as well. I mean, we don't want to um, implement a policy that is going to have a severe impact on protected characteristic groups. So the, the reason for having the equality impact assessment and having uh, elected members trained in that is that we understand the, you know, the types of impacts that can occur and that can allow us to work through that policy and if that policy needs to be changed radically or if it needs to be dropped. I think just to follow on that, um, I can't think in the past few years, I think because there is early engagement and, and senior officers and, and members are looking at options at an early stage, I think these things are maybe picked up at those kind of level of discussions before they would get into a wider budget, budget package, package. So we are managing, I think, to take a lot of these things out when the impacts are kind of understood at an early stage, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, and we would have a very similar process. Not all proposals would go forward um, to, uh, to Council. So that some proposals are, will be changed, dropped or changed along the way um, as a result of the engagement that's carried out. OK, thanks. So to go on to training then, um, obviously you've got your, your officers and elected member training. Um, are they similar? Do they differ in any way? Is it mandatory? Um, is it ongoing? How, how do you do your training? I could come in that for, from a, poli um, a, a political elected member point of view. Um, we do undergo mandatory um, Equalities Act training, so we go through the legislation. However, we, you know, when I came into post, I, I did feel it was important that we underwent impact assessment training, so to understand why we are going through that. So um, our, our staff within the strategic planning kindly provided us with, with that training where we worked through certain examples and developing policy. And I think that helps with a deeper understanding for elected members when we're scrutinising policy and understanding impact assessments. Uh, yes, we have ongoing training, um, both for staff and for members, and um, it, it's similar training, but we, we tend to slightly shorter sessions for, for members, but we do focus on equality impact assessment processes for members and highlighting their responsibilities to give due regard to equality issues uh, in decision making. Similar um, within North Lanarkshire, um, all of our elected members have just recently um, undergone equality and diversity training with a focus on um, their roles and responsibilities um, and as power dynamics and, um, and, and going forward with um, but not a specific um, on equality um, impact assessments, but elected members did raise um, equality impact assessments at the training, uh, that it's um, an area where they would like to, um, to focus further um, in the future training. I wonder, um, and I know this might be challenging for, for council officers to answer, but if, if, it's, <laughs> if it is, just don't, um, yeah, Jennifer can answer, but with all this training and awareness, is there an example that the committee could have where elected members have spotted a budget proposition and thought that the impact on a protected group was going to be too great or that the policy would need to be dropped or changed? Can anyone... Give an example of that. Um, yes, we've probably had a number of examples over the year. One that probably springs to my mind is around um, 
potential impact on our employability services, where the, the impact assessment has certainly changed the decision at the end of the day on, on proposals to uh, reduce costs. Okay, thank you. Okay. Kayla, okay, you finished that line of oh sorry, Jennifer, you no, no. Come in? no. Um that's it. I mean a, a lot of our um a lot of our budget proposals we, we focus quite heavily with in Glasgow in terms of social economic deprivation. Um, so a lot of the proposals that we do put forward does have a look at that kind of de, you know levels of deprivation that is higher um, in Glasgow perhaps in other areas. Um, so I think it is something that you know a lot of our, our budget proposals have been of medium or very low impact. I've just got a small um, follow-up, and, and it it comes from a place that I used to be an elected member myself, and I know that you know undertaking training and and um, sometimes getting elected members along to that training can be quite challenging. Have all elected members had the training, or is it patchy? Um, I believe we've all had the training in terms of our legislation training and the vast majority of the 85 members have had the equality impact assessment training. Okay. Not all have had training at the moment, but we will carry on with ongoing training and encouraging members to attend. In, in North Lanarkshire, was, there was a, um, a motion passed at, at Council that all elected members um, had to undertake mandatory equality and diversity um, training, which has just happened in the last two months. Oh, that's interesting. Thank you, convener. If I cut across someone else's questioning, then just tell me to stop. <laughs> uh, but um, I, I wanted to just ask about training for the public as well. You've talked about officers and councillors, but I certainly know from my own local authority uh, that there's a big focus on participatory budgeting, and I've heard some of you mention focus groups and other bits and pieces, because uh, one of the concerns I certainly have is that sometimes the groups who are uh, most uh, disadvantaged or at risk uh, are, are the ones who are least able to articulate their, their voice, and that members of the public, particularly when budgets are tight, don't necessarily understand or have the information around impact assessments or other things to, to make those kind of choices? Is that something you've looked at at all? Um, um, one of my, my, my colleague who works closely with me has um, um, taken forward the participatory budget in within North Lanarkshire, and, um, and in conversation with him, um, I had suggested that members of the Disability Access Panel um, in North Lanarkshire should be um, part of the steering group um, that um, forms the, the, um, the, the North Lanarkshire um, participatory budget so that they can influence um, access issues and inclusion issues in the participatory budgeting setting. It's a mouthful. Um, so so that, that's one approach that we are, we, we are looking at. Could maybe answer on, on behalf of Glasgow. We have a number of participatory budgeting pilots that has come from our budget this year, um, and the majority of those five are based on uh, protected characteristic groups. So we have socio-economic deprivation, um, linked to child poverty, a BME group, um, and also just looking at a um, community of interest, so as opposed to geographical uh, wards in participatory budgeting. But the main aspect of that is around capacity building and training people how to get involved and get involved in the citizens' fa uh, panels, and that also includes some equalities training. There's a risk, though, that um, within participatory budgeting that we do get are already very enabled, capable community activists and that we do have to take an extremely proactive approach to make sure that groups who are at risk of are, are marginalised groups do um, get involved in, in processes and, and that takes resource and it takes time to help enable people to do that. Um, I know just now that... Um, with our care experience young people, we are, we've been investing a lot of time to look at how they get involved in um, a youth engagement structure, and that requires a lot of support and a lot of training and an additional resource to look at where they're at and to where they're going and the barriers to participation that they're experiencing and how we overcome those barriers. So I definitely think that there is, there's, there's still a job to be done to make sure that those that the, the voices of those that are most vulnerable are heard. 
Morning and Alec Hall Hamilton. No. Thank you very much, convener. Good morning to everyone. Thank you for coming to see us today. Um, I'm very gratified to hear about the training that's going on both across the elected members and the officials. Um, but in my own experience, the experience of members of this committee, that sometimes when something is everybody's responsibility, it becomes nobody's responsibility. If everyone thinks it's happening, it doesn't always. And I'm always minded of the, the time when this parliament passed the 2014 uh, Children and Young People Act. Um, the, it was the first time any piece of legislation had referred to specific duties in respect of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. But I was um, convener of the Scottish Alliance for Children's Rights that year, and I was horrified to see um, half of Scotland's councils divesting themselves of children's rights officers the following year because of cuts, financial pressures. So my question is, um, are there specific individuals, um, either within the elected cohort or the officials, who are responsible for defending and promoting both equalities and rights, not just in budgeting, but in policy and service delivery in your councils? In my role as a city convener is to defend the, the equality and human rights within Glasgow City Council, so I have a strong leadership role, ensuring that that takes place at a policy level. We have uh, many teams across both our council offices and our alios who have equality um, an equality remit. Um, I think the other thing to maybe point out is in our new policy committee structures, we had initially talked about having an equalities committee on its own, but decided that perhaps that would then mean that all the equalities work went to one committee. We have it written in all of our terms of reference that equalities has to be considered in all our policy committees. In our policy um, report templates, there is a section that has to be completed uh, detailing what equality impacts have been undertaken and how that might affect so that we have scrutiny over that. And we also have co-opted members of, from third sector and from equality groups who sit on a number of our policy committees and also take part in the scrutiny of our policies in our, in our papers. Just say some, some further um, observations because I recognise exactly the, the d dilemma that you pose in terms of trying to get a balance between um, it being somebody's responsibility and also mainstreaming. And I think in the time that I've worked um, in the qualities area, I can see that we have strengthened that. Um, we do have a small team of um, people at the centre that work on a range of corporate issues, and I do have. Um, a number of staff that specifically focus on equalities, but in addition, we now much have a much stronger group of staff closer to operational service delivery who have mm -hmm. a better understanding of these issues. In addition, given Glasgow's size and scale, many of our separate we have a, a corporate equality officers group, but then our services like education services um, will also operate their own working groups within their service um, and draw people in from the operational side as well to make those links. We also have a number of specialists um, looking at areas, for example, such as domestic violence um, and hate crime policy to support that work as well. So we have a mix. Um, it can't just be something that's driven at the centre and seen as the job is of the equality team, which I think is maybe where we were 15 years ago or so. But we also do need a centre, a core, to keep driving it through the organisation. Um, yes, uh, similarly, we have a, we have a, a corporate uh, role, which is, is very tiny. It is myself, so we, we do have one corporate post. But we have much um, stronger um, roles now with across services. We have a cross-service equalities working group. Uh, and I do think equality is much, much more embedded across all of our services than it has been in the past. I think in particular in our care and learning service, we have a huge shift forward. They have their own equalities working group within uh, their service. And uh, equalities work has been taken forward much more strongly, particularly within the education side than it ever has been in the past. So it is being seen as other people's responsibility. Um, it's shared across, um, I mean, there, there are the, I suppose the traditional roles of HR, but we also we also have a lot of partnership working uh, locally in, in Highland across equalities because other public bodies are in a similar situation where they may have one person staff who is the lead person. So we work very closely together in terms of support and networking and where we can working together, and I think that's very helpful to us. Um, building on and the 
um, Children and Young People Act, our um, Children Services Partnership have co-produced a partnership agreement um, on a rights-based approach with young people in North Lanarkshire, where they have the, the chair of the partnership and the chair of our council-wide youth fora have jointly signed to say that all business of the Children Services Partnership will be done in conjunction with young people's views being sought um, at every possibility. So um, we've moved from the um, considering officers considering how they would um, include a rights-based approach into the plan to practical examples now where we do have this partnership agreement and the thing is our young people are very empowered um, to make sure that the children's services partnership actually deliver because I think when you, when you raise expectations of young people then they will respond and react. To add to that as well, um, and it's very similar to um, other councils. We have um, an elected member of Equality Champion. We also have a, um, a Youth Community and Equalities Committee, um, and we have young people who come along um, and uh, contribute to that, um, that committee. Uh, we have a corporate equalities working group that has service representatives across the council. Um, they have my own role, um, which supports the, the uh, corporate work um, and, a, a, again, specialist um, a staff across the organisation uh, working on um, gender-based violence, um, housing, you know, uh, mainstreaming it as much as we possibly can. Thank you. Um, again, it's very good to hear all of the steps that, that your organisations, your, your authorities are taking. And I think it's, um, it's fair to say, you know, um, massive organisations, as local authorities are, can do all the things that they have in their armoury to address equalities and human rights. Um, but unless you've got a good um, sort of process by which um, people who are having their rights impacted or have being discriminated accidentally at a local service delivery level, unless that process exists, um, then, then it, it, it's all for nothing. And uh, my question to you is, I mean, the most marginalised people in society are often the quietest as well, uh, hard, find it hardest to have their voices heard. Are you confident, and can you give me an example of um, how that process would take? So if somebody, for example, if it's an equalities issue, if they have difficulty physically accessing a public space or... Um, experience unconscious bias at the hand of a, a council employee. Um, are you confident that they would know, first of all, that they could challenge that and, and raise that with the authority? And how would they go about that? Um, I, I think to answer, um, I think the first part, no, I'm not always sure people do know that, that they have the ability um, and, and know that necessarily a, a, a behaviour or a, a deficiency in the service is, is discriminating against them. Um, I think we do have processes in place, though, um, to allow people to, to challenge that. Um, again, corporately, we, we do try to we, we have we do try to support that. And again, I think through our engagement with third sector groups, and they would quite often, I think, be the first place that people would go to and our elected members, I think it would be fair to say. I think in Glasgow, um, over a long period of time, a lot of our elected members, um, not just the ones who are the equality champions, have got a strong interest in a range of equality issues, and particularly around disability, um, and also around re release and race and religious discrimination. So they quite often would be a port of call if, if there was a particular issue. It's a very similar approach. I don't think any of us would ever say that we're wholly confident that um, all people will be able to access, um, either access our services or be able to uh, find a, a, an effective way of taking forward a complaint. Um, however, I, I think, again, uh, I think the third sector is extremely important here. But I think also because we try and focus uh, a lot of our training, particularly with our frontline staff who come into contact with members of the public in terms of, of equality and diversity issues, um, that that's extremely helpful in terms of raising people's awareness around um, maybe people needing different ways to engage, different ways of communication, and I think that helps us. Okay. Yeah, partnership approach, I think, um, is crucial with other public sector bodies, the police, uh, for instance, and in reach it. We've been doing quite a, a bit of work recently with them, um, the police in relation to people with learning disabilities um, and, and disability hate crime. 
um, and that's been a partnership approach just with the police, but also with um, our colleagues in um, social work and our adult um, um, young people services and, and adult services within the um, within social work. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think we um, would be able to reach everyone if it weren't for um, working with closely with third sector organisations, disability organisations. Um, uh, particularly um, deaf services um, representative organisations as well, whom we work really closely with. Um. Mary Fina, if I may. Thank you. Um, I wonder if the panel um, could give um, committee some information about how you um, balance difficult decisions and, and how you take account of different and competing priorities when you're looking at equality issues. Who would like to start? I mean, sometimes, obviously, as councils, we have to make decisions that with heavy hearts. Um, and um, I know that that's when we were speaking earlier about budget um, um, and budget decisions when we're um, making difficult decisions. And sometimes we do have to make dis difficult decisions, but we might, might need to look at balancing that by mitigating factors. Um, putting in place, um, if we have to close a building, Rosemary was speaking about employability services, and I know something um, recently was one of our um, the proposals around our employability services was to close a building. We know that that was going to impact on um, people that would use that that service specifically. So it was. We can save the money by closing the building, but we need to make sure that we provide the service and we can provide the service in other ways, you know, by using libraries, using community services, centres, making sure that people can access that service, but in a slightly different way. So I think it's being a bit creative in our thoughts as well about how, how we balance and make difficult decisions, and um, but at the same time, making sure that the impact isn't so great that it can't be justified um, and, and that, that's, that's certainly the approach that um, we take. Okay. Uh, and I, I think this is going back to the role of the equality impact assessment is that uh, we're able to take account of some of the issues at a very early stage, it's particularly in terms of officers being able to flag up what the issues might be, what the considerations are, what the evidence might be, where we've got feedback from local groups as well as national evidence. Um, and it, you know, it's because decisions are taken at very different levels in different ways and on a daily basis. Uh, some of it political decisions, some of it decisions by officers, again, on a daily basis. So it really depends on, on what those decisions are. But I think it's trying to be evidence-based where we are making decisions at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, Councillor Layden, I don't know if you've got anything you wanted to add. No, I, I wanted to come in on that. I mean, I think that we always have difficult decisions to make and, and you know, we have some challenges. However, in having a look at we we have our council plan priorities, and a lot of that is based around equality and fairness and dignity and respect. And I think, as others have um, indicated, we look at the evidence base, we look at the outcomes that, and the impact that we can make on people's lives as, as a way to help direct resources. Um, and if we have a look at some of our budget decisions that we made this year, for example, um, we've put around £2 million in to mitigate universal credit and the impact that that's going to have um, in the next couple of months, particularly for um, disabled people um, and people who have learning difficulties. And we know that there's a cum um, cumulative impact you know, um, of protected characteristics. We've also put additional monies in, for example, to deal with child hunger or holiday hunger, as they call it. Um, and this is also to look at and, child and challenge some of the social economic deprivation that we have in the city. Okay. Um, one, one of my um, bugbears when it comes to equality impact assessments and equality training, um, and I know this is shared amongst um, some members of the, of the committee, is that it's something that's done once a year, a box is ticked and it's put back on the shelf um, to be revisited the following year when you remove the dust from the book and go, yeah, yeah, we need to do this again. How confident are you that um, the equality training that, that all of you have received and all of your um, colleagues in your workplaces have received is actually something that's, that's almost a, a living entity within your, your working and day-to-day -day life, so it actually is meaningful? 
come, come in in that. And I think um, Louise would probably um, back me up in this, but almost every committee there is a mention of equalities and how we are consulting with hard to reach groups. So it is a continuous process that we have a look at through all our policy development and service design. Um, we are about to start our budget process again for next year. And again, we are already looking at some of the equality impacts of what of our budget from this year and reflecting those decisions that have been made. Um, and the plan would be to discuss that with some of our third sector colleagues and equalities um, groups that you know represent in the city to see if there is anything further that we can do and if they have any reflections on the budget decisions that we have made. Okay. Does anyone else want to comment? Yeah. I would agree with that. I mean, I, I would even look back going 10 years and equality would come up very rarely mm -hmm. in committees. Now it comes up mm -hmm. at most committees, if not all committees, one way or another. And that's ongoing throughout our committees, not simply around our budget proposals and budget decisions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would say we have established a subcommittee of our education committee, which um, specifically focuses on equalities, young people and communities. Um, and I think that has really helped to make sure that equalities is part of the overall budget plan, the processes, and as you say, not something that just sits over there that we, 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 we dust down once a year. Okay. I don't know if I could just come in just um, thinking about what's been said. I, th I think in Glasgow, certainly, the, the, the makeup of our city, um, equality is very real for our mm -hmm. frontline staff who are dealing with it, um, issues that citizens face on, on a daily basis and some quite challenging issues for some of our newer communities uh, and, and more excluded communities. Um, so I think at the centre we, we very much focus on giving them what we need and an ex example um, Councillor Layden has reminded me was when um, we were developing our equality outcomes um, as well as engaging with, with equality organisations in the city um, and um, with our equality policy officers we also held workshops with frontline staff um, to help them to shape what they think because they, they're, they're dealing with issues on a daily basis so very much trying to, to keep it live. Sure. We also have a, um, an employee equality forum um, which is obviously uh, for, for employees and we hold regular um, events um, for employees and they're also a consultation forum for the council in relation to to all sorts of policies, um, including um, um, budget decisions, and that's um, that as well as um, all of the previous um, mechanisms that I mentioned about equalities and keeping that focus um, uh, makes sure that you know it's, it's 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 not forgotten. It's always got a high profile, and our elected member um, equality champion has also provided a, an excellent focus. Um, to, make, to, to keep equalities high up on the agenda. And we've recently as well, um, I think the Fear of Scotland duty has helped us focus further on equality um, within um, all of our decisions. Um, and we now have uh, within our, um, all of our reporting um, templates to committee, you know, um, we have to provide in, in, in evidence on how we've considered equality and um, fear socioeconomic disadvantage. You've, you've all spoken about the, the marginalised and disadvantaged groups that you are um, committed to in, engaging with. I wonder if, um, across the authorities that are represented here today, if you could perhaps give me an example of the sp specific dialogue and communication you have had with the Gypsy Traveller community, who are an ethnic minor minority and a disadvantaged group. If, if, if you can't have an example at the moment, perhaps you could. I would quite bring like the panel to see whether or not they've had dialogue with Absolutely, Gypsy Travellers. Absolutely, yeah. We do have a Gypsy Traveller liaison officer within our council who regularly. We don't have a, um, a permanent site in North Lanarkshire, but we do have a um, transient Gypsy Traveller community coming through North Lanarkshire in our uh, Gypsy Traveller liaison officer and their housing needs assessment. Um, always um, takes the views and consults with gypsy travellers on their needs. We don't have a specific uh, gypsy travelling liaison officer, but our tenant engagement officers do engage with gypsy travellers in Highland. We have four sites across Highland mm -hmm. uh, and we have regular engagement with them through our housing service in particular. Okay. Um, 
I suppose, like like colleagues, um, Glasgow traditionally um, had a low, a low number of gypsy travellers. Um, occupational travelling is, is the more prevalent uh, trend in Glasgow. But we have worked um, regionally with, with colleagues in the west of Scotland to look at the accommodation um, and site needs of, of gypsy travellers. And that's been taken, that's what has been done through our um, housing strategy. Um, we also do have... Um, a gypsy traveller liaison um, person who is located in our social work services. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, brief supplementary, yeah, and then I'll a, a very brief course. supplementary. While we're talking about marginalised groups, I think it's fair to say that those um, one of the groups in all of Scottish society that experiences the worst life outcomes and the worst denigration of their equalities and their human rights um, are the people to whom the local authority is arguably most responsible, and that's our looked after children. On any given day in Scotland, there are 15,000 uh, children in the care of the state, either at home in kinship care, foster care or residential care. Um, can you give me an example or, or tell me how your authorities seek to meaningfully engage with this community and those of care experience who've left um, their supervision orders? <laughs> to um, give a response to that. So in terms of our looked after and accommodated children, and we, we also do a lot of work with our integrated joint board um, who are looking to redesign and transform our children's services. Um, we do a lot of work with our, our social work services, and I think there has been a lot of involvement to try and reshape um, the way that children's services are being delivered. So moving from the model that we have had for a very long time, um, where um, children are, you know, in long-term institutional care. So, for example, we now have a, a family genealogy service uh, running within Glasgow where we try to support children to, to find perhaps kinship carers um, through looking at genealogy searches. And that's just a sort of innovative way to look at how we can, you know, support children uh, um, within the looked after and accommodated um, sector within Glasgow. And, and I think just, what I'll do, because we've heard from your local authorities, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> Thursday, Thursday morning committees are always a little bit tight, so I'm going to just yes, take one from We have a lot of work in our, our, our care and learning department uh, with looked after children, uh, and in particular moving away from where children may have had out of area placements as well, trying to um, keep children within the area or bring children back into the area. But we've also had a lot of engagement with looked after children and involving looked after children in the shaping and redesign of services, and I think that's been really important and there's been some really powerful messages um, for example children attending committee and speaking at, at, at committee about their experiences and that's been valuable thank you I think there's so much to do in terms of improving outcomes for our looked after and uh, um, children however I do think that you, there is a lot of good work happening um, and within our authority we have been partnered with the Life Changes Trust and setting up a Champions Board and I think that that work that's happening is really, really important um, and look, making sure that our young people um, who are care experienced past and present um, get the opportunity and make sure that they participate in the decisions that affect them um, and I know that um, our own care experience group um, today, not tomorrow, is a group of young care experienced um, young people who have been who are set up to, to challenge um, what's happening in terms of services, and particularly they're interested in the services in relation to education, housing, and employment. And they've, they've, we have helped support them to take part in that process. And their last request was whilst we have six locality forums for our young people, that they, ha they have their own forum, um, a seventh forum, specifically for care experienced young people. And I think it's important that we act when our young people make these requests. And we have got so much to learn from our, our young people that have been through the system. Um, and I think we also need to make sure that we could focus on a deficit approach. And we need to make sure that we look at the assets and we learn um, from our care experienced young people. So I think we've still got a way to go, but I do think that it is an improving picture in relation to improving outcomes for our care experienced young people. Okay. Thank you. Um, I want to ask about um, cumulative equality impact assessments because obviously policies, individual policies don't sit in isolation and we've had a, a bit of discussion about partnership working, um, integrated boards have been mentioned. 
Can you tell me a bit about how you do cumulative um, equality impact assessments? If if you do do them, I know that not all local authorities take that approach, and also speak um, a little bit to the involvement of community planning partnerships and joint boards in terms of delivering serve the services that come out at the end, and maybe some of that um, mitigation or adjustment that you make when you identify that something's going to impact on a group. Sorry, that's quite a lot, so I'll just <laughs> let you breathe. But <laughs> if anyone. Audrey, was it your local authority that does cumulative impact assessments? We, we have for the 2017-18 the um, budget setting and before and the previous budget to that as well. Um, we um, <clears throat> the the last budget when we did an accumulative um, impact uh, that was difficult because at the end. Um, the, the, a lot of those budget, the, those proposals didn't go through um, at the last um, at the last budget. Um, I think the Scottish government, um, when they set their draft budget, um, we realised that there was a lot of room for manoeuvre. There was a significant difference in the draft budget to the was when it was set. Um, so a lot of those budgets, um, those um, budgets didn't go through. Um, but yeah, we do. Um, Try where best we can, you know, to look at um, an accumulative. It's particularly, I mean, it's easier to do that when it's for for a budget because there's so many quality impact assessments being done at the one time. Um, but when they're, you know, you're you're looking at like individual services, maybe doing um, an impact assessment on maybe two areas a year. You know, it's you know, it's difficult to have the focus. Question on that, and I suppose it's just how how do you how do you do that? Do you look at the impact from the perspective of a person with the protected characteristic and then what services and decisions impact on them or are you looking at the suite of decisions you have to make and then mapping it out? It, it feels like it's quite a complex thing. How, what, what's your starting point for it when you do them? Um, I don't oh, if, if you want to get back to us, that's, uh, yeah. that's, that would be, I think we'd be interested to, think about to hear. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, that, we, we've had challenges in terms of uh, cumulative impact assessment. In, in fact, we found it a challenging area. So we would be very interested in any models of good practice mm -hmm. around cumulative impact assessment. Um, what we, we, in terms of community planning partnerships, um, we have, uh, as mentioned earlier, we do quite a lot of partnership in terms of working on equality issues uh, across equality leads. But in terms of our um, outcome improvement plan uh, across our community planning partnership, equality is one of the, the horizontal um, themes which cuts across all of our uh, Inequal outcomes, which are all focusing on inequality in any sense, so that there's a lot within our, our themes that touches on equality in any sense, but um, equality is, a, is a, a theme across all of that. We don't have a joint board, a joint integration board in Highland with a lead model approach, is slightly different from um, other bodies and uh, other authorities. Uh, but within the lead model approach, each organisation will have its own approach uh, to equality. So we're the, the lead uh, for children's services in Highland and equality is built into our work in children's services. So even where there's the joint working, there's the two different approaches that are separate, is that? Well, that's, and that's a challenge, but it's also the benefits of where we do work together is, is include, ensuring that equality is included within that work. So okay. for example, the, uh, where we have integrated plans of any sense, then we need to include equality uh, within that in terms of the considerations that we take on board. And I say a lot of the work that we focus on joint is in its broadest sense around inequality and touches on equality issues and protected uh, groups anyway. Okay, okay. Um, yes, uh, I, I think I would agree that is, it is a challenging area. Um, and some of the things that I would say is it's, it's important that we have more evidence to support cumulative impacts and how we gather that data and having a, a focus on outcomes. But this is also where it is important to do consultation and to continually speak to our equality groups to understand some of the cumulative impacts that our services may have. Glasgow City Council doesn't formally do cumulative 
Mm, no, no, we don't form. Okay. No, we haven't formally. I think for, for the last couple of budget rounds, we've attempted in a very high level way to flag to elected members prior to decision making what the broadly what the cumulative impacts would do. But again, like colleagues, I think we'd be very interested in, in more ad advice and, and, and support ar around how you actually practically do that, I think. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Fulton McGregor. Um, I'll uh, focus my questions. It can be in an interesting time. So, in my own part, just North Lanarkshire, so if Eldrin Liz don't mind, I'll um, focus my initial questions there. I was glad that you mentioned Colbowie. Uh, it was an example, actually, the convener asked of an example of a political group taking something forward, and I know that our SNP group uh, responded to concerns and took that forward to Council. And also it was the SNP group to be partly political for a wee second that brought forward the, um, to the committee that brought forward to the committee for all members to have equality training. So I know that members suggest an Mr McGregor, I think probably what we'll do is we'll, we'll not talk about any yeah, no, specific no. political decisions. I was commenting on uh, my remarks that were made. Um, and I wanted to comment as well that you can, there's some really good equality work going on at Buchanan High School, um, which is uh, really the wood. But how, but how can we make the um, equality impact assessments even better for... For example, like the, the bins situation that happened in North Lanarkshire, the winter services, the, the issues at Drumpelier uh, Nursery. How can we make the impact assessment better there to make sure that it uh, links in with uh, the minority and disadvantaged groups, as other members have said? I wonder if, if we've covered some of, some of that in, in previous um, input from, from the panel in terms of how they do um, equality impact assessments. I think that's well, quite specific things about decisions locally. Yes, yeah, so, um, so I, I was no well. So, so there were there, there, there were widespread um, there were, were widespread issues um, and. Okay, uh, Mr. Uh, McGregor, was, I think. Was, 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 was not political, but okay. Well, uh, the other thing I wanted to ask as well was in relation to uh, Alios and Length organisations, in particular in uh, North Lanarkshire and in Glasgow Life. How do you make sure that equalities are brought into these organisations as well? Thank you. Quite conscious of our time, yeah, so yeah. if no, somebody could um, just jump in, it would be, it right, would be wonderful. Fine. Yeah. Um, well, I just talk, um, generally Glasgow Life is part of what we um, are kind of cosy term for our, our council family. So, um, Within Glasgow Life itself, that they participate in our corporate equality structures. They um, are part of our framework for equality in terms of our equality outcomes agreement, although it's not a specific requirement of the public sector equality duties. Um, they're included um, as part of, of our plan. They also have a very senior, um, the different structure, obviously they've got a board, but one of the, the directors of Glasgow Life is also their equalities champion. Um, and I know just from the, the daily work with them that it's something that they're, up, they're very upfront about and, and that it's very visible, I think, in the service that they offer. Um, and I could give you a lot of, probably I haven't got time for today, but I can give a lot of practical examples of, of the kind of visibility and the types of approaches that Glasgow Life have taken. So I, I feel certainly comfortable with them as an organisation. Mm -hmm. They're part of our wider fam family and they can demonstrate a lot of areas of very good practice in that work. Thank you, that's helpful. I have um, one final question, if, if I may, um, and it's around the national performance framework. And we've spoken a lot about equalities um, this morning, but obviously there's a new outcome in there um, about human rights. Can you, um, as, as succinctly as is, is possible, which I know is always a, a challenge, but um, let the committee know how that will inform your budget process in the, in the coming, coming time? That, that is something that we are starting to have a look at in Glasgow um, and officers have been meeting, I think, with the Scottish Government colleagues to talk about how we can now fit that into our budget process and into our quality and impacts assessment training. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I think in Highland we still have a way to go to fully incorporate human rights issues into uh, some of our decision making. I think the area where it is certainly getting stronger is within children's services, whereas children's rights are, are really being considered uh, on a regular basis. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think the philosophy of the participatory budgeting is a, is a bit taking a human rights based approach to budgets, budgeting um, anyway, because it's about 
community self-determining, you know, like how um, they um, want their, their money, you know, to be spent within their, commu their communities. Um, we do have um, human rights integrated within our equality impact assessment process. But I do think that it is still a working process to, um, I suppose, to, to, to that understanding about what human rights are, I think, is still, um, still at, a, um, not at a very conscious level. Um, for, a, for, a, for a lot of people and I think that we still need to, there, a lot of work still needs to be done on that and okay. like Rosemary I think that there's a lot of work done within our children's services and adult services around human human rights but it needs to, to be broadened out along the, to other parts of the council. Okay, well that um, brings us um, to a close this morning. Thank you very much um, for your evidence, it's been really helpful. I um, appreciate that we're, we're quite squeezed for time on a Thursday so we may well write out to you and ask you for some more details around things but thank you very much and I'll close the session and ask the gallery to clear. <laughs>